Hey guys, today I have Flint Anderson on of Old Man Energy, and we are going to talk about what it means to have old man energy, what it means to go through some of the most challenging programs in your life, and that you guys can change the direction of your life at any time that you want. All right, so with that being said, Flint, please uh, introduce yourself better than what I did, and uh, tell us about Old Man Energy, and, and let's actually kick off with something we've both done, 75 Hard. All right, that works. Hey, well, John, thank you for having me on here today, and as my shirt says and the intro says, I am Old Man Energy. Um, host the Old Man Energy podcast, and that is my legacy to leave behind to young men today that are coming up, want to be good dads, husbands, fathers, and leaders, and to men my age that they're having a shift in life where they're going from being full-time dads of young children to dads of adult children, which is a radically different <laughs> mindset. <laughs> so we, we were talking offline a little bit about 75 Hard and where Old Man Energy came from. Um I didn't start out doing 75 hard for any other reason other than I was, I wanted to do something for myself. And I'd been a dad of seven children for so long. They started aging out. I had a little more free time. Um, I wanted to do something challenging, something for myself that I'd never done before. And um, so I told my wife, I said, well, I think I'm going to do 75 hard. And this is right after Frisella started it. It was like yeah. he started it in February, March. I'd, I'd started on Memorial Day. Oh, nice. I'm telling you, I, I was the least likely candidate for success. <laughs> 60 pounds overweight. I woke up Memorial Day morning hungover <laughs> at 11 o'clock in the morning and oh, put wow. my shorts on and my shoes and went and walked around the campground, and I was miserable. Um, my my lovely bride was not convinced that I was going to finish 75 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that helped you or hurt you? Um I, you know, I, looking back on it, I don't know because okay. the one thing that the one thing that I've come to realize is our spouses—they're not negative on purpose. They just don't like no. watching us fail. Yeah. And typical guys, we have a lot of harebrained ideas that we run out after. <laughs> We're going to do something, and then we fall on our face, and they're the ones that got to pick up the pieces. So after a while, I yeah. think they just say no out of self-defense. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to watch the love of your life continuously bash his head into the wall and be like, the door's two feet to your left. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's funny you say that. It's funny you say that. Sorry to interrupt, but my no. wife, if I ever get hurt in front of her, and I mean this, if you ever want to see my wife piss herself, if I hurt myself in front of her, she can't control it. She will laugh uncontrollably. That being said, me and my wife have an amazing relationship. It's just one of those oddities. And I think she's the real reason behind most of my success because she frees me up to do the shit that I need to do. And I don't have to worry about what's going on at home. But that being said, my wife had similar. She's like, why are you doing this to yourself? And I just said, because I can, and I want more, you know? And yeah, but Des was the same way. And I, I feel the same way about Des. I wouldn't be where I am without her. Um, yeah. She is aggressive in all the ways that I'm not. She's dominant and she is so just insanely logical. Yeah. Um, she has more common sense in her little finger than I've ever had in my entire life, which kind of pisses me off sometimes, but that's okay because I should listen to her sometimes a little more than I do. Um, but it, it, she came on board when she when she realized what was going on, and I didn't start it to get healthy. I just wanted to do something for myself, and I, I didn't, I couldn't spend money on anything. I mean, I could have, but I'd been used to supporting kids, so I was like, well, I want to do something hard. And I was, I was not the, um, I was not the poster child for health when I was growing up, and I wasn't the athlete. I was the band nerd, and I checked all the boxes for being the poor kid, getting bullied, getting picked on. So doing a physical challenge, yeah. which for me, the mental part on 75 hard was not hard. It was the physical part, mm -hmm. uh, was something that was incredible. Well, a couple yeah. months in, I came off of, I was on, when I started, I was on 16 pills a day and three shots a week. Oh, wow. I uh, had rheumatoid arthritis, had a flare up previously to that. It was really bad. So I couldn't do what I thought was heavy, intense exercise. By the end mm -hmm. of the first round of 75 hard, um, I was off almost all that medication. And that's a story that I'll tell, or I, it's not a secret. I mean, I'll tell it. It just yeah. really doesn't fit too well with this. But suffice to say, she believed me finally 
um, when my mom was coming to visit and her flight kept being delayed and kept being delayed. So my mom finally came in about three in the morning and I hadn't done my second workout yet. <laughs> got mom home, got her settled and said, okay, well, I'm going to do this. She does roused up a little bit said, okay, be careful. Went and walked and she told me afterwards, she said, that's when I realized you were going to finish. <laughs> Yeah, I and she never she never tried to hold me back, but she made sure that she knew that she didn't think I was going to finish at first until that day, and then she supported me until the end and has ever since. So that's awesome. That's awesome. I can tell you that, at least for me, I didn't realize that I had some potential generational curses. One is alcoholism that runs in the family. Right, doing seventy five hard. The first time I went through it, and I've done it every year since it came out. Mm -hmm. First time I went through it, at the end of it, I'm like, I haven't had a drink in 75 days. I said, when was the last time in my life since I was, and I shit you not, since I was maybe 15 or 16 years old, because I was not a good kid. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was the opposite of what you said you were in high school. I was legitimately the opposite. The asshole athlete, just cocky, <laughs> like, just... Uh, I'm all, I'm embarrassed of it. You, you're the guy that would have picked on me in school. I don't. I wasn't. I was actually not a bully. Gotcha. I did not. I was not a bully. I didn't like it. I still don't like that shit today. Um, but the reality is, I didn't realize how much I drank. You know, because it's socially acceptable. Of course. You know, it's not like you see somebody shooting heroin on the side. That's not socially acceptable. Right. So people know they have a problem when they get down that rabbit hole. But the guys that drink two, three, four times a week or just on the weekends, sometimes they don't know that it's a problem. Yeah, that's very true. You know, so tell me what were some of the biggest things that you got and how often do you do 75 hard every year? Um, I did it every year for a long time. I have not done it this year. OK, uh, not for any other reason other than. um at the beginning of the year, I was doing the workout regimen. It just didn't mm -hmm. qualify as 75 hard. I did have a drink every now and again, and I was doing my workouts back to back because of the scheduling I was doing for my businesses. Yeah. That's a that's another story. We lost at the end of the year. Um, I lost two thirds of a multi million dollar business, and then managed to lose the rest of it at the beginning of the year. So my priorities shifted just a little bit <laughs> to rebuild that <laughs> empire there. Um, but that being said, the I learned so much that first round of 75 hard that um and every round since it really helps get get my focus back that i learned that i could do things that i set my mind to i learned that my body took very well to weightlifting and how much i actually enjoyed it um i learned about perseverance and i learned about not taking shit from people it, i'd never been able in my life to walk into a room and look every man in that room in the eye and not be intimidated now, I probably deserved that more, but I was raised in a single mom household. My dad was absentee until late in my teen years, so I didn't really have that interaction with other guys. It was always weird to me until 75 Heart yeah. that I was accepted into the guys club. I was like, well, no, I don't really fit here. I'm not sure how this works. After 75 Heart, I never had an issue with that. Yeah. Um, the other major challenge with 75 Heart is when I comp completed Live Hard. I started phase three of Live Hard oh. March 17th of 2020. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they locked the world down two or three days into it. That was interesting. I was gonna say that's hard to meet people. Hard I to introduce every, yourself. I, I knew every gas station attendant for ten miles of my house. <laughs> <laughs> why is it? He's not get why he's not getting gas. What is he doing here? What is this guy doing? Why is he picking up the parking lot? <laughs> what is this guy doing? <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. I met, met a lot of my neighbors because they were outside talking. But um, yeah, that was that was interesting. But you know, by by that time, and it. It really started out as a physical challenge for me and it ended up being mindset. Yeah. By that time, I knew I was going to finish before I started phase three. It did not matter what happened. But one yeah. thing, and one thing Frisella talks about in 75 Hardest is he sometimes goes on the mantra, it's always day one. You always day, it's, it's 75 days one. Yeah. And I, it's his program. I'm not second guessing his program, but my, the mindset for me is different because your mindset on day 74 is radically different than day one. Yes. Day one, you could start over again tomorrow or the next day. Day 74, my leg could be broken. I could have the flu and be called into work, and I'm still going to finish. Yeah. I have two days left. 
So day 74 for me was a radical mindset. So every time I want to get something done or I'm having trouble and I'm struggling, I'm like, well, it's day 74. I need to get this done. Doesn't matter how tired I am. Do you ever get the depression after it? I don't know. Uh, Depression. It's something missing. Yes. It's something missing, which is why I structured this year to be the way it is so that I still, I, I wanted my, my realization after doing it four or five times is I got really, really good. And I'm going to apologize if I, if I swear too much. <laughs> it's all right. You can curse all you want. really fucking good at checking boxes. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I read every day. Yeah. I drink a gallon of water. I thought I already yeah. did that shit. It was the consistency and it was the discipline. And I was like, man, after I finished that last year, I was not depressed. I was pissed. Yeah. Because I was like, I'm right back to eating like crap and I'm not exercising twice a day and this and that. I want this to be a lifestyle. Yeah. And this, um, this last couple of weeks where, um, I've been sick and I've had the flu and haven't been able to walk across the room without breathing is the longest I've gone without working out at least walking at least once a day and working out at least every other day all yeah. year long. Yeah. And so when, when I chose to make it a lifestyle, so if that's what you're referring to as a depression, yes, because it's almost just like, no, I need that. I need that structure. I'm used to yeah. it now. And why do we stop? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. No. Not, yet. Yes, I'm done with 75. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Day 78. Well, uh, what, 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 what am I yeah. going to do? Now? I, I always try to do just go right into phase one. Yeah. Um, I've never completed the live hard. I'll be real with you. I've I've been open about that. I've never completed Live Hard. I've done up to f- completed Phase Two. Uh, I just personally I hate the idea of spending Christmas because uh, I always start on January one. I hate the idea of having uh, Christmas where I'd be middle of Phase Three. At sounds least that's me, what I tell me. Sounds to me like you had to start on a different time of the year. <laughs> I, yeah, and I'm uh, probably going to, <laughs> probably going to <laughs> figure out, figure out where you don't want to be. At. Um, Des, when I first did it, she was like, I'll never do that. She'd go walking with me every once in a while. And we did this and that. Well, the, the next round that I did the next year, she actually did 75 hard. Oh, that's awesome. failed on day 73. Cause she forgot to take a picture. Oh no. Completed it. And this is, this is how hardcore the, the woman I'm married to is. She completed it. And less than a week later, started over and did it in its entirety. So for like a hundred and um, uh, what is one hundred and fifty five or one hundred and sixty days, she did yeah. it back to back. Um, awesome. When she's tough as shit, I'm, I I admire her for that. Um, but no, it was in that again that the, the physical wasn't hard for her. She's not a huge reader, mm-hmm. but she threw herself into. And this is the thing that I've seen with her and with other people that have gone through the program is they'll find that they don't normally do things, but whenever they get engaged in it, they throw themselves into it and realize that they're getting benefit from it. Now, they may fall back out of that habit later, but during that 75 days, they see the benefit and the understanding of what's going on. Um, And I've seen that happen again and again with friends that I've made online, people that have done it locally, just all of them. I have a question. Have you ever tracked your earnings on it? Um, not on 75 hard, but since I've been an entrepreneur for the past 20 years, I mean, it, it's real easy to go in and pull any report from that time yeah. period. Um, yeah, I can tell you right now, the businesses grew during that time period. A hundred percent. That's where I was getting at. Yeah. They, 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 because you're focused and you have to be, you have to yeah. be more disciplined or you're not going to get everything done in the course of the day, especially in some of the later phases. Phase well, three. Phase one. Well, you, I, I can't speak to phase, the phase yeah. three, but phase one to me is especially depending on what you put on the, the eight critical tasks. Yep. That's, that's in and of itself a, could be a full day event. Eight critical tasks is no joke. And I know that there's a, there's a significant number of the population out there that says the 575 hard tasks are that plus three additional. I never did that. I did the 75 hard tasks independently, and I had eight, li- eight tasks on my power list. Yeah. And it was exhausting. There were many times where I was up either writing copy or sending emails at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning because I just simply didn't get it done throughout the day. Uh, and that bleeds into the next day. Then you're tired. And you know, like if you're in any of those phases, it doesn't really matter which one. If you don't get your first workout in at a certain time, you know the rest of the day is miserable. Uh, because you're dreading it, which makes it worse. <laughs> and then when you actually do it, now you're dreading the second one. It's like, God, I got to wait my two or three hours. 
And the thing that cracks me up, listen to him to answer some of the dumbass questions that people ask about 75 Hard. The program is not that complicated. No. I'm impressed he's written two books about it, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of material to dig up. It is. It's like, okay, well, the second the second one is really a compilation and expansion on the first one. But still, that um, I tell you, I've, I've got the original 75 Hard Challenge coin, and I am so proud of that coin because I earned every piece of that coin. I've got the second one, too, but. I love that thing, and I'm very proud of it. Um, it's awesome. So let's let's kind of change gears. I want to talk about family, and then I like to talk about business. Business last. All right. I have three kids. I feel like I'm looked at as an oddball in today. We're a little bit of an age difference, probably not much, but I don't know how many people my age even have three kids. Most Most people I see, one or two. So the fact that you had seven. And my parent, my, my mom was one of seven. That's incredible. At what point was the fuck it? It doesn't even make a difference anymore with the number of kids. Was it when you were outnumbered? Was it the second one? The fuck the fifth, the seventh? I don't know. I want to know for my personal. This is for me. This isn't for the show. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ten four. Well, after first of all, after two. Yeah. That you just kind of at that point it's just combative. So you don't, you don't really you don't really notice the difference because they start helping look out for each other or conspiring with each other, but from a parental yeah. aspect, it really doesn't matter. It's kind of the no. same thing. Um, I used to joke and tell people that um, Des would cook enough for three or for six, and then everybody wow. show up and just fight for the food. <laughs> um, our our story is a little unique, so I'll, I'll define how we have seven children, and then I'll answer your question because it was in any very unique way. It was a conscious choice for us. Okay. Uh, Des had three when we got married. Our oldest three were hers when we got married. So I, I married and became instant stepdad. Now, out of those three, two of them I raised from very young age. They call me dad. And we never made a differentiation in our house because three of the younger ones we adopted from the state of Florida. Okay. And the seventh one, he was one of our son's friends who was going to be sent to a boy's home because of family situations. He wasn't a bad kid. There was just nobody that could take him at the time. Yeah. So when he came, he came to us at 13 years old. So that's where the seven come from. Now, I love the way you asked the question. At what point did he reach? Fuck it. It doesn't matter how many kids. Um, <laughs> when we had, when we adopted Haley and Gary, Ashton wasn't born yet. Those are our youngest. Mm -hmm. um, that was that was a choice of your, of our heart because they were, they were in a bad situation. They'd been neglected and we were relative caregivers for them and just decided, okay, well they need a stable life. We already have three kids. Anyway, the kids were helping. They just blended in with the family. Yep. When Ashton was born, which was in 2005, there was actually two, they're all three, a sibling group. And there was actually two other children in that sibling group, mm -hmm. one of which passed away and one um, we were set to adopt. Well, Ashton came into the picture. The state contacted us and said she's not going to be allowed to keep this child. I'm like, well, okay. Well, then we're so for us, it was like, okay, there's another child in the Midwest that we're supposed to adopt. That's part of the sibling group. Mm -hmm. Another one. What are we going to do? Yeah. Um, right in the middle of all of that, we found out that the uh, the foster family was trying to adopt the other child who the these children were were relatives even though they were wards of the state of my mm -hmm. wife's family so she contacted her brother her brother stepped up adopted that young man and then we adopted ashton ashton was born he was six weeks old and he went to go to court in kansas to fight for his brother and didn't even know it so there was a conscious choice and Des and I sat down and looked at it and said, okay, if we're going to do this, is it going to affect our lives from the next 18 years? Mm -hmm. And there are some times where we look back and wonder uh, if we made the right choice, especially when we believe we made the right choice. We love the children unconditionally. They are our family and we're very proud of our family. But even when you adopt and you consciously make the choice, you run through those same choices as you do whenever you have children. It's like, man, am I really the best dad for these kids? Am I really the best leader for these children? Did I do a good job? And I don't know if that was the, I, I feel like that was the heart of your question, not not the, the verbal of your question. But <laughs> you, um, yeah, we were an anomaly. We drove yeah. the biggest van on the planet forever because of hauling these kids around. And then they didn't. And there were times on Friday night where you just, okay, how many kids are we feeding tonight? Because you got teenagers and our friends. house to hang out and friends. And yeah. 
It was like, all right, there legitimately we would order five to seven pizzas at a time and just there would be nothing left because, okay, well, there's a lot of kids. But we knew they were safe. We knew they had a good environment. Yeah. Um, and at some point you just have to trust your raising. But, yeah, we never worried about people making fun of us. But, man, we definitely look like a clown car getting out of the getting out of the van at karate lessons or whatever <laughs> sometimes. Listen, I got to tell you, the, the one thing I am most proud on this planet is the family I, I you know, me and my wife created a lot of love. Yeah. Having seven kids, I could only imagine, you know, that's incredible. It, it's it's not easy. It's awesome. It, it, it is. We, we get a lot of interaction, especially now that they're, they're adults. So now with there's grandkids coming into the picture, um, they never all seem to get along at the same time. <laughs> But we do have a good time when they come over. Sundays are usually pretty chaotic because the different children will be showing up and now their spouses in the mix. And so it never that huge family never really goes away. It just changes participants pretty much. <laughs> they tag in others. That's right. I love that. That's how it was with growing up in my house. I love that. Yeah. Part of it. You don't see that too often. Yeah, you really don't. And it's a lot of fun. It's kind of chaotic from time to time, but um they all I say have, time to time. They all get just on. Um, we had, when Ashton moved out, he recently got his own apartment, just turned 19. We had exactly 10 days of only the two of us in the house before an adult child moved back in and a granddaughter. So it was, it was pretty quiet. It was nice. It was peaceful, but honestly, I kind of missed the, I missed the chaos and the, yeah. just the, the goings on of a family. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And that's, that's a lot. I mean. I feel like sometimes I'm overwhelmed with three, right? And then running a business, I could only imagine seven. It's it's incredible. Give you a lot of credit. For I, I appreciate that. And then just yeah. for the record, I was never not overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was never enough time to do everything, and there was always something that needed to be done. But you know, being yeah. a, being a full time entrepreneur, I was able to be there for the football games. I was able to be there yeah. for the band competitions. I was able to be there for the ROTC competitions, and mm -hmm. that mattered. It made the exhaustion worth it. Absolutely. So, tell me about business. What's what do you do? Um, business is to me. Business to me is freedom. I um I, I the the standing story that I tell to make people remember why freedom is important is one day it dawned on me that I got up every morning and I'd wash my face with a razor blade, tie a noose around my neck and go to work for people that I didn't really care about making money for people that weren't giving it to me. And then I'd go home and got to spend whatever leftover time I had with my family. Yeah. My boss told me what time I had to get up. He told me what kind of car my wife was going to drive. He told me what school my kids were going to go to. And that just kind of pissed me off. Yeah. So what do I, I now I do several different things. I own a couple service based companies, um, very large handyman aggregator business, janitorial mm -hmm. company. And uh, that allows me the freedom to spend time in the old man energy coaching space, which I do networking events locally. Mm -hmm. And I teach entrepreneurs how to be entrepreneurs because I looked around and the one thing that was really missing in the online coaching space and the teaching space is there's a lot of coaching groups out there. There's a lot of functional groups out there where they'll, they'll teach you how to market. They'll teach you how to sell. They'll come in, they'll do it all for you. All of this. The one thing people weren't teaching is how to be an entrepreneur. You can be a doctor, be a damn good doctor and not have any clue how to be an entrepreneur. So you need to work in a practice, even if you want to work for yourself, yep. you can be a handyman, you can be a plumber. And it's either going to be you and a helper for the rest of your life, or you need to learn how to scale. You got to learn how to be an entrepreneur. So no matter what your trade, no matter how good you are at the craft that you have decided to pursue, there is still a huge gap in how to think and act and even know what you need to do to scale your business as an entrepreneur and how to think like a business person. 100%. So that's, that's what I get to spend my time doing now through one-on-one -on -one coaching and my mastermind groups. Um, and then my personal development, though 75 hard made me an accidental fitness influencer. So there's always a personal <laughs> development piece of it there. I like that. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I agree with everything that you just said when it comes to, cause I see it on the lending side, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I can't tell you how many doctors have terrible credit. Why? Yeah. Cause no one taught them. They know how to do the thing that they get paid to do, 
but they don't know how to expand upon that because they're not teaching that in school. They're not teaching in high school. They're not teaching in college. They're not teaching it in graduate school. And then what you see from half the people that want to promote the shit is a bunch of clueless fucks giving other clueless fucks advice. Man, right? don't even get me started. No, I did. I just, I just got started on the last podcast with that. So I'm not going to do it again. I don't want to hit two. I don't want two shows back to back to back bashing an entire industry. Yeah, go, go watch. I think it's episode 52 of the old man energy podcast. I just rip the guys who used to be real estate gurus and now they're blue collar gurus and now they're um, entrepreneurial gurus. And it's just, their advertising changes and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. You go back through their, um, through their Facebook or their social media and there's something different every six months. It's like, what the yeah. fuck? Yeah. So you go and, and for the record, you scroll through any of my social medias. I sound like a damn broken record. You can, it's the same story over and over and over again. I teach consistency. And what's what's Ed always tell us? Uh, it's not about saying new thing. What is it? It's not about saying new things to the same uh, old people. It's about saying the the old, you know, the same things in a new way to new people. Yeah, in a new. Uh, way. I've been. I'm the same exact way, and I, I got to tell you, I don't understand how people think they can have success or build something that's worthwhile without that crazy amount of time like i haven't I, i've integrated it's four years old it's it's a spin-off of sprout lending which was also my company okay uh so i've been doing this i've ran a, a business for probably seven or eight years very successfully i've crashed businesses as well i crashed a a gym business i lost six hundred thousand with uh P, i guarantee you people you know all right, we, we, yeah, we, 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 we each lost 600 K. Um, but I've been in lending for 15 years. It took me 15 years to get where I'm at and where, um, I would even, I wouldn't even say I'm comfortable. I'll never feel comfortable, but to feel like I've actually built something. So it, it drives me crazy that people think that they can hop industries and master something in a year or two life doesn't really work like that or jump in there and start selling it they've never damn done it <laughs> yeah i mean the, the different and you're in the you're in the finance industry so you're going to understand what i'm about to say very specifically the reason i have service-based businesses is one i understand that but two they yeah. print cash yeah they're very difficult to scale i know how to do that because i've been in them for the past 25 years but they pr they produce cash flow to allow you to use for other things. And yes. if they crash, you can replace that cash flow fairly quickly as long as you have the infrastructure in place. So you don't have this massive overhead of bricks and mortar and everything else. Service-based business, if you have some skill, can, pr can be a cash machine that feeds your other machines. But unless you know how to do that, you can't teach people how to do that. You can't go from the finance industry. And I mean, no, I mean, no insult, but you can't go from the finance industry and start being a handyman unless you know how to fix shit. Yeah. My, I mean, I don't want to say what I was about to say, but oh, let's just do it this way. Hear it. <laughs> so uh, there's a better likelihood of, of my wife fixing something. Okay. I'll, I'll say, like the cars I can work on. Okay. But the shit around the house. I never took any interest in that. I don't care. I always like the business aspect and I'm not particularly handy. My wife comes from a uh, family of GCs, you know, she could rebuild shit that I couldn't even take apart. Yeah. You know, half the battles admitting that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, um, we have, we have a handyman, um, a husband special <laughs> <laughs> where, where we will come in and knock that honeydew list out while the husband's out of town. <laughs> That's fucking great. I need that. So, and you know, oh, I love that. I've never once had a husband get mad. I have had a, a funny phone call. I had a long term client. She used to be a receptionist at a staffing company that I was uh, associated with years ago. And we'd go mm -hmm. in, and her husband traveled for work. So she just had us do handyman stuff. Um, she handed me the phone one time. I was hanging, I was still doing service calls myself at this time. She handed me her phone one time and she goes, This is for you. And I'm like, My phone's still in my pocket. And so I picked it up, I was hanging a ceiling fan, I was up on a ladder. And um, he goes, Hey, Flint, this is somebody remember his name. This is so and so was her husband. I just wanted to talk to the guy that's always in my house when I'm gone. <laughs> and he, he led with that. He was joking, but he was he was like, Look, I'm really grateful. 
for you coming in and doing that stuff. Cause then when I am home, I don't have yeah. that list hanging over my head. I can spend time with the kids. I can spend time with her. I can spend time doing the things that matter. Yeah. So admit right. it, guys, uh, if you can't fix shit, admit it. Now we said that from a business standpoint, but also if you can't fix shit, don't go start a handyman business. No. If it, I wrote a book called Any Idiot with a Hammer. <laughs> That's a great fucking title. <laughs> now the book is is stories of funny handyman stories associated with that conflated with or um um, back to back with how to set goals. So to help you help you make goal setting a little less boring. Um, I give that away as a free as a lead magnet. I wrote it um, on a whim. Actually, I, I was dared to write it in a Sunday morning and it came out. and It was just awesome. So <laughs> anybody that wants that, shoot me a DM and I'll be happy to send you a copy of it. Only thing I ask is review it and send me some messages back on how much you like it. <laughs> I love that. Hey, where where could they do that? Um, I the Old Man Energy podcast is on all your favorite platforms. Uh, I love YouTube the best okay. because I'm huge on authenticity. Uh, mm -hmm. As we just got done slamming some fake people out there, um, I believe that if you're looking somebody in the face, you can read a lot more in their facial expressions than you can. So I love YouTube. You can follow me anywhere though. Um, social media, I'll make sure and get my links over to you. But if you do Thank a you. Google search for Old Man Energy or Flint Rock with a PH. And the reason okay. it's Flint Rock with a PH is because that's been my title or been my handle since before the internet existed. Because yes, I'm not. <laughs> um, or Flint Anderson, doesn't matter. Just Google it and I'm the first okay. two pages. So it's not a problem. Um, you can send me a message anywhere and we'll get back with you. I would prefer a like and a follow if you want a free copy of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for a shameless plug? Yeah, I like it. Oh, I, I wrote a book and. Uh... I give a lot of respect to anyone that, that does because I wrote maybe three chapters and it was a group effort on how to start up a business. And I, I don't even drop it, but um, it's a lot more work than people realize to write a book. People it don't realize it. They don't. Yeah. Uh, and for me, editing was not, I didn't edit it myself, but getting the edits back, you want to humble yourself, write something and send it to an editor. You're giving, you're giving me goosebumps right now, man. <laughs> when, I, when I first, I wrote the manual, what every guy's dad should have taught him. I wrote that 12 years ago. And it's uh, just basically everything I wish I'd not been taught as a young man. Yep. I gave it to an editor. She looked over it, handed it back to me and said, this will never sell. It is, you, you wrote an instruction manual. It's like I bought a new stove. And I was like, well, it's in the title. Yeah. Yeah. It's the manual. She goes, also, this is terrible grammar, just all the things. It was awful. So um, I published it, but I self-published it. Uh, it's currently being re-edited. I've got a good editor now. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you you got it. You want to blow to your ego? Write something and send it to somebody. To, you'll get it back like the worst English teacher you ever hated. <laughs> yeah. And it's nothing's kind. Like, I can handle constructive criticism. This was not that. Yeah, it was just <laughs> ripping you and blasting you. Yeah. That's so funny, man. Um, yeah. Now I do I have, um, and I, I will. This goes into your business question. Uh, we are releasing um, Beyond the Handshake: Mastering the Art of Power Networking. Uh, that is coming out next week. That's my most recent book. Uh, it basically mm -hmm. takes my networking system, puts it in a book, and teaches you within an hour how you can walk into a networking event and start leveraging and doubling and tripling your effectiveness in any networking event. I love uh, that. I will. I would like a copy of that. So send me that link as soon as it comes out. I, I sure will. I'll send out the links are live now. We just haven't started the advertising. So I'll, I'll provide that to you that um, I was, a, I, I didn't learn networking because I'm look at that and I'm going, oh, I'm a businessman. I want to, I want to learn yeah, how yeah. to network. That seems important. Cold calling sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. I, I did not set out to be an ambitious, ambitious networker. I was a lazy cold caller. Yeah. All of us. I was like, man, if I could get people to introduce me to their friends and their, that's just a lot easier than knocking doors. And don't get me wrong. I've, I've knocked my fair share of doors. I cut my teeth on selling office equipment because I didn't want to sell cars. Yep. So I, I know how to cold call, but man, it sucked. It was much easier to network. And yeah. what I realized now is there's a ton of people networking. Networking is resurging in a big way. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but online, yes. virtual networking, in-person events, they're, they're everywhere now. But yeah. what it is, is that you walk into these network events and you feel like these people are just shooting you just like a machine gun of business cards. Yes. They're pitching you. I'm like, no, you guys are doing it all wrong. 
<laughs> so, and I don't want to lead with that when I walk into a room. So I figured, okay, I'll just start teaching people. So I run private networking events up here that are nice. station only. They're free. I don't charge for them, but I also mm-hmm. teach people how to network at those events. That's really cool. I, I will, I will say I threw, I've spoken at a couple of stages, but I threw my first workshop mm-hmm. two weeks ago. Okay. If you've never thrown an event, you have no idea the amount of work and anxiety that goes into that and shit always goes wrong always pure chaos <laughs> yes Ab- absolutely so that was a true eye-opening learning experience of here's how you throw an event and by the way here's what not to fucking do how did the event turn out uh it the event hit its goal in the fact that the people that were there, we made the impact we wanted to. The marketing and the things leading up to the event was more chaotic than the event itself. So I realized and I learned a lot and my setup was wrong and uh, I have it fixed and I'll be running that event again in January. Basically what I did was if you, I know you know Alex from OZ, right? So yeah. love what he does. I went to one of his workshops and I'm like, you know, how could I use this for lending? And so I, I started a one day workshop where we come in, entrepreneurs come in, we build their business credit. It costs half of what it normally costs. And then we do a one-on-one strategy session and we look at all their business, their goals, we break it down and we show them the path forward. And we explain where they have to improve when it comes to getting certain financial instruments, like let's say an SBA loan or a line of credit or equipment financing and how to use those programs to your advantage to get maximum tax savings and any other benefit that would come from that. And so we put that together. It was great. But the lead up to it was I don't know what I was thinking, looking back at how I did it. I just ran a couple of Facebook ads. Well, I have a list of probably 150,000 people that I could have been emailing that are very familiar with me and my brand. And, uh, and then I did it in a time, like uh, the next couple months are not really a time you want to be trying to throw in person events. You know, you're competing with the holidays, you're competing with the election. And so I got that event in and done right before. And that's why I said, all right, we're going to do the next one January and we're going to do it and we're going to improve here, here, and here. But here's the thing. If I never threw the first event, I don't know what what I would have got right, what I would have got wrong, and I don't know. I don't have a path to fix it. And so as an entrepreneur, you have to try multiple things, and you need to expect to fail uh, a couple times at least or make a couple of mistakes before you actually get it right. Yeah. So that was a great learning lesson. get Get out there and fuck some shit up. Oh, I'm great at that. That's, that's my specialty. <laughs> that's that's how I learned everything I know. It it was not from being naturally talented at much except for being able to sell. Other than that, yeah. it was from making doing it wrong as many ways as possible before I figured <laughs> out how to do it correctly. Dude, I love that. So. Spoken like a real entrepreneur. That's <laughs> actually done it. That's it, man. I just I, I can't do anything else at this point. I I it it isn't in me. And you know what, even at this stage of the game, and I don't know, you've been doing this a long time, not quite as long as I have, but you've been doing it a long time. Even at this stage of the game, there's still days where you wake up and you're just like, God, Mm -hmm. everything's falling apart. I'm a failure. It would be so much easier just to wake up, put in my eight hours, go home and not worry about anything. It's crazy. I, I haven't had a day job since 2004. Yeah. April 14th at 10, 15 in the morning to be exact, but that's beside the point. But even still, sometimes you're exhausted and it's just like, man, it'd be so much easier and you know what it would, but that's why it's so important to have what you a reason why you're building what you're building and why you're yeah. running after what you're running. You and I obviously are huge on family and we did it and are doing it for our family, mm-hmm. but to get it, something to get excited about that goes beyond motivation and gets you out of bed and will make you do that extra work at 11 30, 12 o'clock at night when you've been up since four in the morning. That's the real key more than anything yeah. else. And if your audience can take away one thing from my piece of advice is have your dream turned into a task, turned into a goal, know how to do that. Because if you don't, then when you can't see 
everything for the clouds or all the bullshit that's in your face, you won't know where you're going. My light calls him his standard. He does the same stuff every day because he knows it's going to work. Even if he can't see the end right then, he knows if he does the things every day that need to be done, he'll be fine. Motivation has nothing to do with it. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Flint, for coming on. Um, this was, you dropped a ton of value. I, th- I would like all the links so I can pr- get these on the show. I, I'll and get them all over to you. Thank you. And if there's anything I can ever do for you, please reach out. I will. I will. I um, Our connection has been has been brief before this. I know I just applied to be on here, but I, I'm going to look to connect with you again because I think, I think we can offer some real value to each other, especially coming at entrepreneurship from opposite sides of the spectrum. I put yeah. businesses in place to print cash. You look at ways to get businesses, loans, and credit. And yep. I haven't taken one out for any of my businesses. I made them fund all themselves. Nice. So it's, um, I think we can have a really interesting offline conversation about that. And I, I would agree. There, there's some people that I want to introduce you to as well. So, okay. Appreciate uh, that. Awesome. I will get that information over to you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And if anybody has any questions, shoot me a DM. Let me know. I'll be happy to in, in, answer any of them. I'm an open book. Oh. A hundred percent transparent, and that's one of my core values. So I love that. Uh, you you can't catch me in a gotcha. You can try, but I'll answer you honestly. The <laughs> always pretty. <laughs> Sometimes it's kind of yeah. ugly, but I'll tell you the truth. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> All right, guys, Fo- follow follow Flint. This was great. Thank you, Flint. Hey, thanks, John. Talk-